This is Ghana's biggest national park and the largest wildlife refuge, home to many natural plants. The Morley National Park, situated in the northern region of Ghana. As we drove through the main entrance of the park, I was anxious to find out what nature had in store. This is the administrative block and after exchanging some pleasantries, it's time to go on a safari. My tour guide, by name February, was on standby to receive the crew. I realized he had a gun and I was curious to find out why. What animals are we likely to get attacked by? Possibly. I cannot mention any. Oh, what kind of animals do you have in there? Okay, sure we have the there. antelopes, uh -huh. like the buffalo, okay. roan antelope, mm. atavis, the elephants. Mm. Yeah. And the dangerous ones could be what? The elephants? Any of them could be dangerous, you know, right? Yeah, any of them could be dangerous because none of the animals here have been tamed. And now the tour begins. The journey is rugged as we drive through the bushes. Finally, we arrive at a spot where we are told there is a pond nearby where the elephants often come to bath in the afternoons. Like many people, I was curious to see the elephant for the first time. Not so far away from us, I spot some strange animals. Wathoks, what we normally call bush pigs. How come the foreigners know that there are wathoks here, there are animals here they can come and look at and we don't seem to know? Because honestly, like I told you, I've seen these creatures only on TV. You know, there are cartoons of these, there's the cartoon called Timon and Pumba. And I think Pumba was, was, the, was a warthog, the bush pig. Yeah. I never knew that we had warthogs here in Ghana. When it enters, it's entering a hole, it goes with the, with the back. When it's entering a hole? Yeah, it goes with the back. Why is that? So that the... The snout? The tags. Okay. Will serve as its defense in case of any attack by the lion or the leopard or the hyena. Oh, so these are also endangered species? Yes. Really? They are in the water. In the water. It was a great experience learning about war dogs and time to move on in search of elephants. The very first sign of their existence which I saw was the giant footprints. Finally, behold two elephants, a sight and an experience one will relish for a lifetime. They haven't seen us? No, no, you know, it has foresight so oh, okay. the trunk mm -hmm. serves as the that is the most sensitive part of the elephant the trunk so, the trunk so you use it in drinking eating and at the same time to smell mm. so when they take our smell you see how it's curling it train it up mm. when you take our smell now it will uh, move so normally when we are the tourists we try always to take the wind direction mm. so we always take the direction of the the smell of the, of the elephant yeah so now i can see that now we are taking their smell that is why they are so uh, stunning. The okay. smell is now though. Okay, so it means that if we, possibly, if we possibly change direction and the wind blows towards them into their trunks and they can smell us, yeah, yes, they will quickly move. They'll move. Now, which direction would they be moving possibly? Towards us? No. Defense or right away? Move away, not towards us. They'll move oh, away. Really? Yeah. So, have you had situations where some of these elephants you know, were injured or sick and you know, all that? You had to kill them? Oh, no. That incident has never happened here before. Okay. And these are not tame. There's no way. You know, in some places you can have a ride on an elephant's back. Yeah. And all that. It's not possible to try to to do this here, is it? Yeah, you can only tame it when it is very Maybe, young. Maybe, yeah. Very when it's young. young. Yeah. But as they are now going to do So, what, what do they really feed on? What do they feed on? There? The no, grass? they are grazers and browsers. Mm. So, this ed ed They're elephant. basically herbivores. Yeah. Yeah. And do we have incidents of poaching? <coughs> 
where, where they feel endangered? Have, have, have there been any such incidents where we yeah, have you know, poachers coming in? Oh, 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 this is huge. You know, in a conservation Ooh. area, you cannot do away with poaching. Yeah. Yeah, but I think now it has been brought to its minimum uh, level. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that you've had incidents of poaching where people are looking for the ivory of the elephants? That is. Some years Some back. Some years back. But yeah. this, this, this were not Ghanaians, were they? Or they were Ghanaians who were actually they were, them. Yeah, right. they were Ghanaians. But we don't eat elephants here in Ghana, do we? No, we eat. We do eat elephants in Ghana? People eat. Oh, okay. People eat elephants here? Yes, they eat. But elephants sold on our markets? Yes, they sell them in our markets. This is news. I don't know about that. Yes. We don't disturb them here at all. Yeah. And you're saying you have over 400 of them? Yeah, over 400. And what's the lifespan of an average uh, elephant here? 60 to 70 years. 60 to 70. In a situation like this where we get supported by an elephant, so then what? They could send signals to the others and then they could launch an attack. Or it could just on its own begin to attack. So before or it, it could run. attack, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it trumpets. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the body language of it too and let you know that this animal would like to launch an attack. Mm, so the trumpet is the first signal? So more like a warning signal? Yes, the trumpet is a, a warning signal. Of and then what would the others do thereafter? After this, uh, if one happened to follow, mm -hmm. the rest would uh, to run after the rest. Maybe the rest may decide either to follow or stay back. And in this case, what could happen to us? Oh, it will not hit me. I know they can run very fast. Yeah. They run very, very fast. fast. Very, it's very part fast. of the uh, the uh, the uh, weight. It's very fast. Mm, so it means that now we are the, the end endangered ones. <laughs> <laughs> we are the endangered ones here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Ah, because we've heard stories of elephants okay. attacking yeah, settlements, yes. attacking settlements, and bringing down buildings and all that. But it has never elephants. Muli has never. Okay. Attack anybody before they only try to scare you. Mm. No initial. No, they are their territory, so yeah. definitely. No initial. I told you, every animal has a critical uh, distance. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go beyond that, they try to scare you to move back or a bit. Yeah. So what, they're going to the water again. But, and that's yeah. a, this body lad. Hardly the uh, flies get is. Uh, Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So it's more like a protective cover. Yeah. Ah. So when after this, then it dries up. Then. <laughs> see now you see me. Okay. I'm so fascinated the level of protection that the older elephants are given to the younger ones. I mean, what, what's, what's the whole idea? Is it because we are here or naturally that's how naturally. they operate? They move in a colony, yes. in a group like yeah. that? No, those that, they come in a group, a uh, family. Okay. So after they enjoy themselves in the water, they go, they separate to their family, their uh, familyhood and then move. Okay. So in a typical afternoon like this, you find them coming out to what? To, to bath. Because the weather is so hot, yeah. and we're all sweating right now. Yeah. And then what? They go into the shade for a while, mm -hmm. feed. As we saw, we saw them feeding, and now they are bathing the mud. Mm -hmm. well, what's the idea of the mud here? No. Why are they bathing the mud? Because initially it looks so black, but now yeah. it's looking so grey. No, so after swimming, the the pores of the of the body is open. Mm -hmm. So they bath the mud, yeah. they close the pores, uh, the pores. Then sometime. Uh, uh, by way of protecting itself by flies sitting on uh, on it. Okay. And then uh, this, okay, just by, by to protect heat. Mm. Yeah. But when it dries up, okay. Then the body starts to itch it. So oh, it has to come. Itch. Yeah. Ah. So you come back to the, the pool. The pool. To so tell, tell me about this pool here. It, it's a pond actually, right? Yeah. How, how deep is this? Is yeah. this natural in the first place? No, it's artificial. Oh, okay, so how do you actually get the water? You you dug? Was it a dug out? Yes, yeah, it's a dug out. It's yeah. a dug out. Yeah. Okay, and how deep could this be, really? Uh, well, I've not taking the measurements of it. Mm. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned earlier that there are crocodiles in here as well. Yes, there are crocodiles. So where could they be right now? In in in, in the pond? In the holes. They have holes. Oh. At the edges of the. 
at the edges of the pond. Yes. Uh, so they also go to hide in the hole yes. just to cool off a bit. Yeah. And then so what what's it like? The elephants go in there to to bath, and then the crocodiles are in there. <laughs> what's the relationship? <laughs> When the elephants go in there, what, what happens to the crocodiles? Oh, they, leave the they go to the if they are at this end of the water, mm. they also go to the other bank. Okay. To also do their own things there. And then I... But how did you get the crocodiles here? Because this is a, a man-made yeah. pond. So how natural. did you? No, wait, wait. Is this a natural pond or was yeah. man-made? Man-made. Yeah. Man-made. But yeah. how come the crocodiles ended up here? Is it that you brought in crocodiles? No, and we they, didn't bring anything. They, in they reproduce and eventually. That's cool. Okay. Bring in any crocodile here. Tinga, see one, shows his head up there. Oh, there's a crocodile there? Yeah. yeah. So, how many crocodiles could we have in here? Are oh, you not too sure? No. Oh, I see there. I see there's a lot of some movement in the pond. Some movement in there. Wow. Yeah, it's there. You can see it. Yeah. You can see the crocodile. See the head. It, it appears it's actually approaching. Oh, there's another one there. Is that a crocodile? Oh, that ugly thing there. Yeah. Wow. We have a lot of those in the Look at even some over there. Yeah. Okay, so if we are patient, we'll see them coming out. Yeah. That is the now uh, they will not look at one. Here. Okay. Where? Here. Oh, that's a crocodile. You have no patience when they try to come out like we may see maybe it's going to chase you. Yes. Yeah. So is it possible to run away from them when they when they start chasing us? Yeah, you have to run. No, I mean I'm looking and I'm trying to appreciate their speed because we're told that elephants run very fast in yeah. spite of their weight. They are very fast. You see, uh, the speed uh, limit of is 60 kilometers. Mm. So after the 60 uh, kilometers, and the speed continue to. To appreciate. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, so that means it's not as safe. You can compare the speed of an elephant to that of a lion or a jaguar or a cheetah or any of those fast, fast moving cats. So let me ask you, in a situation where um, you are told that maybe you need to transfer an elephant from Mole National Park to let's say Kumasi Zoo because maybe the elephant in Kumasi Zoo died off, how would you, I'm sure it's a tranquilizer right? You just shoot it with a tranquilizer, it yeah. falls off, yeah. and then you tie it with a chain, and then what? Lift it up. That with tranquilizer, the, uh, it's, uh, every uh, every hour, mm. you have to give it another shot. Another shot. Okay, the tranquilizers can only last one hour. An hour. Okay, they wear off after one hour. So then what? If, if if you don't do that again, the elephant gets up. You're in trouble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but you, there hasn't been any such situation where you've had to transfer any of these elephants to. You know, another location, right? No, no, no. Wow. That's not happened in Moli here before. Wow, and they're all in their natural habitat. Yeah. So beautiful. I mean, it's a real spectacle. I can actually count what? One, two, three, four, five, six of them. But you're saying there are over 400? Yeah. So where could the rest, the rest be? You know, the park is very large. It mm. covers an area of four. How, how, long is it? How, how big is the park? How large is it? 4,577 square kilometers. Wow. For some, for some reason, I'm not scared. I don't know. Of course, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. For some reason, I'm not scared. No, no, it's just <laughs> No, it's trying to scare us. Oh, is it? It just ran and came and hit the branch. <laughs> so they can actually approach trees. You know, we've heard yes, that they can actually, yeah. you know, quell their trunks yeah. around the tree and then. Yeah. Yeah, they've seen us. For wow. now, the wind is blowing towards them.
time to hop into our vehicles and continue our safari through the park and catch a glimpse of other beautiful animals and plant species nature has to offer. This area is supposed to be a Guinea savanna eco zone with short trees and grasslands. But an interesting spectacle at the park is the beautiful variety of tree species and the striking landscape from bovouts to floodplains, savanna woodlands, and gallery forests with two spectacular waterfalls in the northeastern part of the park. These are buffaloes which were spotted at the steep hill plains in the Morley National Park, numbering over 50. I, I can see an interesting structure there. What is the structure? That is the tree height. Tree height? Yeah. Meant for? Uh, for tourists who mm -hmm. come here, come be a... Uh, uh, on it, okay. it's a viewing platform, okay. and then uh, have a view of animals that troop in here to uh, take this uh, salt lake here. Um, how safe is it? Because this is a forest area, snakes, some wild an I mean, animals. Yeah. You can actually spend the night here, right? Y yes, with an the armed guide. Oh, okay, with an armed guide. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not too safe to be here alone. Alone, yeah. And That's what what trees is it on? Uh, Danelia olivaris. Danelia olivaris. Yeah. But how dangerous could it be if you're here alone with a tour guide, an armed tour guide? Yeah. Uh, it's not even allowed to uh, tourists to move alone in the park. How many of these do you have here? Mm, we have about four of them in the park. Four tree heights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what kind of animals? You get to see the same animals: the elephants, the what hogs, the birds, the antelopes, and all that. Yeah. Sometimes the nocturnal animals like the leopard. The oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. There are leopards here? Yeah, we have leopards and hyena. But how, wait, but how safe would it be for one to spend a night here with a leopard <laughs> or a hyena? You know, that, that sounds scary. Most, and all the animals here are not all that uh, aggress, aggressive like other places. Because mm. here we don't harm them. Yeah, yeah but, but these, are, these are aggressive creatures by nature. I mean, and these are canines. A uh, leopard, a hyena, these are dangerous, you know, endangered species, but what would, how, how safe is one when one decides to spend the night just to have an appreciation of these nocturnal animals here? Yeah. Uh, we, that is why before one can pass a night here, mm -hmm. we get you an uh, armed guide. Okay. Yeah. To so we'll take care of you to be following. Uh, so the armed guide doesn't sleep? No, he doesn't. But you get to sleep? You can sleep. Really? And uh, is, is no mosquitoes here? Yeah, well, before one can pass a night here, we have to have a mosquito net. Okay. We tie it here, and then we are, we are matched. But then again, there is no place of convenience around, is there? No, we have to dig it. You have to do it in the bush. <laughs> <laughs>
Sada region presents a fantastic opportunity. Uh, they're a natural um, habitation for all kinds of, of um, birds we are aware of, of different kinds of uh, animals. People are particularly interested in elephants and monkeys. We've got a number of sanctuaries that naturally exist within the region. Our focus will be on making sure we're able to put the infrastructure and the standards behind investing in the tourism sector to create the right sort of experience for the tourism community. Before you start asking someone from outside of Ghana to come and see it, domestic tourism, encouraging your, your, your social network to, to see your communities. The people who were born in Accra, whose heritage is in Damango or Avuima, and they've never gone there because their parents didn't take them, and in their adult life, they themselves don't see the need to want to go there. So if you haven't gone there, how are you going to celebrate it for me to want to go and see what you have? Because of the vast nature of Moli, it is possible for investors to actually to come in and then develop walkways. Walkways that are canopy-like, that can actually facilitate people to actually work on those walkways and then at the same time view the vast biodiversity that actually exists in Moli. Sada will play a more facilitatory role, a more catalytic role to ensure that investors actually come into Moli and then look at the potentials within it and get prepared to actually put money into it. Away from the bushes, this is the first point of call for any tourist who wishes to go on a safari. How much do you pay? A Ghanaian pay 5 CDs per person, a non Ghanaian pay 10 CDs. So you pay 5 person. CDs to do what? To embark on the safari tour, that to have a look of the animals. Just 5 CDs? 5 CDs. That for a Ghanaian mm -hmm. per an hour. So if you, and okay. we do any, any of the activities we embark on the, in this park, we do a minimum of 2 hours. Okay. But you can choose to do more hours depending on the amount you have within okay. the CD. But that's quite but reasonable. A non Ghanaian pay is for an hour. Yeah. A non Ghanaian pay 10 CDs per person mm -hmm. per an hour. Okay. Yeah. But I'm saying it's still very reasonable. Yeah, it's, it's not reasonable. Too, yeah. It's not too expensive. Yeah. And you have the benefit of actually visiting the museum, yeah. which is for free. I, I never knew that Molly had such yeah. facilities and here, and I'm, I'm very, very impressed. This is that's the a, oh, that's a beautiful craft, craft store. shop. And I, uh, uh, initially, I told you we have 33 French communities. Okay. So most of these uh, crafts have been brought from the communities. The communities. Yeah. Okay. We sell, then they give them their money. Their money. We also have some benefits from there. Yes. 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 I think I'm impressed by what you're doing here. So I would I would buy one of this for 50 CDs, is it? Yeah. I would I would buy one and take it back to Accra. And I think it's it's good that we come people come up here and then yeah. you know support their business. Come again? Oh I think I can I can I can give a, an extra. Okay, you know what? I'll I'll pay the 15 and then you can have a tip of 10 CDs. At least for your for your little effort. It's not bright, this is just a tip. I think this piece of craft work, you know, is very symbolic. I just bought it from the the craft shop at the Mole National Park, thinking I was just contributing to at least supporting the the, the, the park. And I have just been told exactly what it means. Now, if you look at this chimpanzee here, I think it's covered its ears. Hear no evil. See no evil and speak no evil. Food for thoughts. As the sun sets, it's time to say goodbye to a memorable experience at the Molly National Park.
day two and the tour continues. This is the administrative block of the park and I decide to say hello to management. This is a map of Mole. Mm -hmm. uh, to start with, this is Damango. Okay. You know, this is the road from Fufulsu, Busunu, Damango, mm -hmm. then you are in Larbanga. Once you are in Larbanga, you are just uh, three kilometers to the park boundary. Okay. And this continues, the Larbanga, the road continues to Sola mm -hmm. along. So the southern part of the park share boundary with the Larbanga or Damango Fufusu Road. So when you are driving on the Damango Fufusu Road, you are actually driving on the southern boundary oh. of the Mole National Park. Okay. And to the to your, to, your, to, the, to, to the south of the road is the what we call the Kani Kani Forest Reserve. Mm -hmm. So this actually the road so runs a through. It's, it's a forest a reserve. Okay. It's a, because of weak protection, um, there's a lot of illegal activities going on, logging and mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah, so it's a forest reserve. Mm -hmm. Then this is the park headquarters. This is where we are. Yes, so just about two kilometers from the gates. Okay. This is where we are. In fact, this is the road network we have. Wait, the, you're kidding me? Just this portion? Just this portion. Right up to this. That's all. For this whole area? Exactly. This is a... Less than 5%? Yeah, less than 5%. So this is the wet season access. And even there, in the wet season, you see this river, you see this area, mm -hmm. it can get flooded. Okay. And once it is flooded, That's you can't even, yeah, you can't even go beyond this. So even the coverage reduces in the in the rainy about season. Percent of it or less. It's, it's about five percent. About five percent. The dry season coverage I'm talking about, then you can continue. You see, this is a mo the Lovi River. It's a okay. big river. It's, a, it's about thirty meters span. Wow. Then you continue to the Mole River. Mm -hmm. This is the Mole River here. The span is about forty meter. Forty meter span. Huge river. We need two big bridges on this to be able to make it accessible during the rainy season. So it is only in the dry season when the water levels go down that we can at least manage to drive. And this is Upper West, this part. You exit here and you are in Upper West. Why is somewhere there? This Bulinga, so why is over there? So looking at what we see here, <coughs> ideally it means that we cannot just have one office. We should have about six or seven exactly. or more offices dotted across the entire uh, uh, landscape. For purposes of protection mm -hmm. of the park, we have a big camp here, this camp, Bawina camp, to the east. We have about 22 staff there. Uh, Dussier, we also have about 20, it's a big camp. We have about 22 yeah, staff there. Right, yes. Then we, you didn't go there. Oh, we didn't? No, no, you, 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 you oh, didn't go you beyond there? here. <laughs> you didn't go beyond this okay. point, yes. Dusia is in Upper West, far away. It's about, uh, yeah. In the rainy season, if you have to go to Dusia, you have to go to Sola, you have to go to Wa, then before you come there. In the dry season, it's only 77 kilometers, very short. Mm -hmm. Two hours, less than two hours drive to that place. The but in the, if, if you have to go there in the rainy season, you have to travel 300 kilometers. That's just exit. Exactly. Exactly. And then Jam also have a 22 uh, staff there. So this is how we have distributed our staff. Then Paria, we have a small group, 10 people there. They are not there permanent. We move them every three months. Because, like you see, the whole place is, you know, it says we have to keep staff there at least to protect the northern part of the park. So in terms of protection, this is how we have distributed, deployed our men. So from their base camp, they now deploy to cover certain bits. Mm -hmm. why, why do you rotate the men? What's the idea? Here, it's such a deprived... No, those in Bawina, Dussier, Jang, we don't rotate them. Okay. Once in a while, we transfer them. After two years or three years, we transfer them to other camps. But those here, uh, it's so deprived mm -hmm. that, like I said, you have to go through the overseas area to get there. Yeah. Virtually, there's no any commercial... So we put them there, like um, temporary base. You go there for three months, you work because your family is here. You leave your family here. You just go there on a, like a duty. You go and perform three months. Then we pull you. We send another team there so that we don't leave the place vacant. Yes, Mule 
National Park. It's uh, one of seven national parks, six wildlife resource reserves, two wildlife sanctuaries, uh, one strict nature reserves, two zoos, and the five coastal Ramsar sites managed by the Wildlife Division of the Forestry Commission under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. Yeah. Mole was established in the year 1958 uh, in a typical Guinea savanna vegetation or ecological zone, uh, predominantly uh, open savanna woodland interspersed with grassland, uh, bovals, flat plains, scarp and gallery forest. Mole is the first wildlife protected area to be established in Ghana and the largest wildlife protected area in Ghana. It covers an area of 4,577 square kilometers. That is uh, 457,700 hectares. Yeah, and spans two regions, the northern region and the upper west region. The objectives for establishing Mole, just as all the other protected areas, is to conserve the universal outstanding values of the site. This include physical, natural, cultural, and historical. Uh, and then to protect and maintain life-sustaining processes such as uh, water catchment, soil conservation, and the genetic diversity, then to create opportunity for research, education, recreation, and tourism, and last but not the least, to generate economic activities within and outside of the park. Mole is endowed with um, rich biodiversity and is home to over 90 mammal species, including five primates, uh, over 300 bear species. 33 reptile species and then uh, 9 amphibians and 120 butterfly species. And also in terms of plants, uh, we have about uh, 742 vascular plant species have been recorded in the park, some of them endemic. Indeed, Mule has four of what is normally referred to as the Big Five, which is of high touristic interest to tourists. And these are the, the lion, the elephant, the buffalo, the leopard, and the rhino. It is the rhino that we don't have in Mole, but we have the other big five. That is the lion, the leopard, the buffalo, and the elephant. And indeed, the Mole elephants are of special breed. You know, you don't find them anywhere. They are so friendly, they are not aggressive. Annual, you know, visitation of this is about um, 14,000. Tourists per, per year, indeed, and that was even when the road network leading to from Fufusu or from Sola to the park was not good. The number could have gone as far as to 20,000 last year, but for the Ebola outbreak, you know, um, they were still recorded up to 14,000 tourists a year, domestic tourists. But of course, uh, some of the daring forest tourists still made it. Those were, who were not restricted by their organizations to visit West Africa still came. But last year we recorded more local tourists than you know, um, foreign tourists. But in, in previous years, the, the reverse used to be the case. And I think that that has also been boosted by the, the construction of the road from Fufusu to Sola. That has you know, improved you know, movement and transportation generally within this corridor. Indeed, the only existing overnight accommodation facility we have in the park is the Moli Motel, which was constructed by the Wildlife Division in 1964. It's a 35-room capacity. That has even reduced to 34 now because some of the rooms have been converted into storehouse and all of that. Uh, not only is that facility too small to accommodate you know, the increasing number of numbers of visitors that are coming to the park, we're looking at getting the private sector to develop and manage tourist facilities so that we as wildlife division will concentrate on delivering on our mandate which is to protect the park's resources, the integrity of the park. And you know, um, 
to be able to attract any private investor into investing in those facilities. What is the selling point of Mali? The selling point here is the wildlife. 95% of the tourists to Mali are coming to see the spectacular wildlife we have than the other attractions, whether it's a scenery landscape or whatever. And so no investor would put in his or her money if the, the, the pulling for, that is the wildlife numbers, are not encouraging. And so we think that to be able to attract investors, we should concentrate in the, making sure that the park is secured first and foremost, and then for the animals numbers to, to build up to a level where it will be attractive to, for private investors to come in and then uh, invest in large development and management. The animals have what we call home ranges and you don't restrict, this is not a zoo and so you don't want to do that. What we can do as a management intervention uh, in building up animal numbers, like I was mentioning, once you give it the park good protection against uptake, against poaching, against other illegal activities that interfere with the animal, once you remove that factor, the numbers will autom I mean, naturally increase. As a management practice, you can introduce artificial salt. You know, in the dry season, <clears throat> this is a savanna ecological zone. In the rain, in the dry season, most of the river, the water sources get dry up. We live with few pools of, you know, water and few rivers running. So the animals spend a lot of time searching for water and food and this salt. And so they convert their energy, the energy that they would have used to reproduce. They rather use that energy to, to walk around and look for water. So as a management intervention, if we are able to develop water points across all sectors of the park, develop water holes and then the salt lakes and all the habitat requirements evenly and stop poaching, the numbers will automatically build up. This is Ghana's Northern Savannah Ecological Zone, a place where great things happen.